All right, let's explore business ties now between China and the U.S. with our expert, Dan McClory, president and head of China at Bowston & Company. Welcome back, Dan. Thanks, Rochelle, and happy 2017. Thank you very much. You too. Now, in terms of what both sides would like to see happen in this U.S.-China relationship, what are their ideal scenarios? Well, I think the ideal scenario is that we get along and we're able to advance each other's economies. I mean, I think that's at the heart of it. And you may say that's in conflict from time to time, but I had a perfect example of it today right here in New York on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. The head of global listings, John Tuttle, was taking us around for the opening bell, and there was not one, not two, but three Chinese companies present, all desiring to achieve an IPO or a listing in the U.S. on the New York Stock Exchange. I think if we take it back down to that practical level of companies trying to get ahead and trying to do business, I think we'll find a lot of common ground. Now, Trump said that he would take punitive measures against Chinese goods, and China is already vowing to retaliate if he goes through with that. Hardly the most harmonious start to his administration. So how do you see trade ties shaping up going forward? I think this is a lot of theatrics, a lot of positioning. I think we have to sort of exhale. We have to be aware of what's been said and what's going on. But I think we really need to look at what's going to happen when the parties come together to negotiate. And if you look at Donald Trump, his business career, he's done this frequently. Um, he will go and make brash statements. He'll then get behind closed doors and negotiate a deal that somehow works out for both sides. And Rochelle, as you and I both know, China is an excellent negotiator. They're great at setting the stage. Of course, they desire predictability much more so. Uh, so this is a little bit unsettling. Um, but I think this is going to be a very interesting back and forth between both of these extremely powerful nations. Now, what may work in the boardroom may not necessarily translate when it comes to the international stage, and some analysts are banding the term trade war around. So given the number of Trump's cabinet picks with a very hard line on China, what do you think is the possibility that relations perhaps could escalate to that point? Well, you're right, Rochelle. When you look at sort of the, the big three that have been named, you've got Navarro, who is, a, let's say it nicely, a China hawk. Um, then you've got uh, Leitzinger, who just got named as trade representative, who has a history of going after steel and dumping. Uh, and then you've got Wilbur Ross, the billionaire, of course. So you're certainly starting to see some appointments that are going to set the stage for some very, very heated conversations between the parties. Um, again, I think that pragmatism will ultimately set in. I think uh, Trump will be set straight on some issues which he has misjudged or overstated, like China being a currency manipulator when, in fact, China has been attempting to keep their currency more valuable instead of less. I think these will start to become apparent through his advisors, and ultimately, cooler heads will prevail. Now, one thing that could get in the way of that are his comments that he's been making on the One China policy and also the call that he took from Taiwan. How do you see that perhaps impacting trade relations? Well, you know, we heard from Nathan, and I mean, it's pretty telling what the reaction has been in China on the street, so to speak. Uh, and I think there may have been a misjudgment on the part of Trump as to the importance that receiving that call signified. Uh, I think he's probably now attributed it to maybe a little less political savvy than he should have had. But I still put it in the category of this is an act, this is uh, some stagecraft, not statecraft, but stagecraft uh, that he's undertaken right. just to try to garner some advantage, whether it's through unpredictability or otherwise. But he will, at the end of the day, understand the out and out importance of the One China policy. And just lastly, Dan, obviously what happens between the U.S. and China can affect, can affect other countries. So how do you expect that relationship to affect trade with regional powers like Japan, South Korea, and even Russia? Well. A precursor to that, which was discussed earlier in your show, uh, is the whole Asia pivot strategy of Obama. So that's certainly being called into question by the incoming Trump administration. Uh, and again, as we heard from Nathan, that was seen as a policy perhaps of China containment. So what was discussed most frequently in the lead up to the election and somewhat thereafter is that there may exist some geopolitical void. Uh, in Southeast Asia as a result of the U.S. rethinking this China pivot. Uh, and that could open up opportunities for the surrounding countries, um, of course, in terms of trade and economics, but also politically. Uh, I think there might be a little more freedom of movement, uh, so to speak, of those countries um, in a government and a political sense than there has been under the Obama pivot. 
All right, well, we'll have to leave it there, but thank you for your insights. Dan McClory, President and Head of China at Bowsted & Company.